Um, okay, and I'd like to give some background. The League of Women Voters of the United States supports the abolition of the death penalty. And this position was voted on and approved in 2006 through concurrence with the League of Women Voters of Illinois after they did an in-depth study on the use of the death penalty. Their study uh, summary lists seven reasons for this position. And I will provide three of them now, um, but I can be asked later uh, if you want, want to hear more of them. Number one is in practice, the death penalty is unfair. It targets the poor and other vulnerable people, people who are mentally ill, brain damaged, um, and members of an ethnic or racial minority group. Number two, the death penalty is not a deterrent. States without the death penalty have crime rates equal to or less than that of Illinois. And number three, Reform has been tried and it hasn't worked. In uh, 1972, the US Supreme Court declared the death penalty statutes in 40 states as unconstitutional. They ruled that there, were, um, there was arbitrary sentencing, which resulted in cruel and unusual punishment. In 1976, after various states enacted reforms, that limited jury uh, discretion, the US Supreme Court held that the death penalty was constitutional. And so now it is my extreme honor and privilege to introduce Maria De Liberato, our speaker and the executive director of Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. As a capital litigation attorney for 16 years, Maria has handled all aspects and stages of capital representation. She began her career as assistant state attorney in the Miami-Dade County, where she prosecuted serious felony cases in the career criminal unit. She then joined the Capital Collateral Regional C Council, where she spent nearly 13 years representing individuals on Florida's death row in their post-conviction appeals. Among the many highlights of her career was obtaining the freedom of Clemente Aguirre, who was, and sorry if that's not pronounced okay. correctly, who was exonerated after serving 14 years of uh, improper incarceration, 10 of them on death row. She is also a certified yoga instructor who has been trained in uh, trauma-informed yoga. She teaches for an organization that brings yoga to vulnerable organizations, including the military, people in substance abuse recovery, at-risk youth, and the incarcerated. And so I turn it over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you so much for having me um, speak tonight. And also with me is Bridget Maloney, who is our communications coordinator um, for FADP, which basically means she's the brains behind this operation. So she's rolling our Facebook and um, some screen sharing. So she'll be, if you see her sharing some things as well. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to share with you a little bit about sort of myself, my career and trajectory, and then a little bit more about the death penalty in Florida. And sort of where we are in it, where we're going, where we'd like to be going, and how you can help if you're so inclined to do so. And then like Janet said, we'll have plenty of opportunity um, for questions. And I do always want to make this a conversation. Every time I talk to folks about the death penalty, um, there's always so many questions that, you know, for me, I've been doing this for such a long time that sometimes it's, you know, I kind of spit up, spill off these, you know, fast things and acronyms, and I want to make sure that people understand and, and get all of their questions answered. Um, so I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. So as Janet said, um, I had the privilege of starting my career as a prosecutor. Um, I really do firmly believe that everybody should, if you're going to do criminal defense work, or if you're going to be a prosecutor, you really should have the opportunity to do both sides. Um, it allowed me time as a prosecutor to see the impact 
of violent crime uh, against victims, against people, and sort of what that does to them. And then, you know, sort of switching to my time doing capital defense, and I'm now still a part-time public defender in the Sixth Judicial Circuit, you really get to see the other side of how people get to a place where they're making these very desperate, deadly choices. And so I feel like my perspective in there is, you know, not, is very, very well balanced, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Um, but I have spent the bulk of my career with the death penalty, working with people either convicted and sentenced to death or facing the death penalty. And so I, you know, have more knowledge than probably I'd care to sometimes about Florida's death penalty and, and how we do it. So I'll kind of give you a little bit of sort of statistics background and then more about what FADP does. Um, Florida has generally anywhere around 350 people on death row, um, give or take uh, you know, based on sentencing and things, but about 350 people on Florida's death row. It is the second, the second highest population in the country. So California is first, um, Texas, Pennsylvania, and Florida sort of all flip-flop usually for second and third, but I believe we're in second place right now with the number of people we have on death row. Florida also has the unfortunate distinction of leading the country in death row exonerations. There have been 30 men who have been exonerated from Florida's death row. And there have been 99 executions since the reinstatement of capital punishment in uh, 1972, as Janet mentioned. So when you look at the numbers that way, for the 99 people that we've executed, we've exonerated 30. Um, those numbers are pretty startling in terms of Florida's death penalty and how we get it wrong very, very, very often. And so um, it's, and I had the privilege of representing one of those exonerees, Clemente Gary, who is one of FADP's board members um, and also a dear friend of mine, happens to be. And he has been home now for close to four years. He came home in 2018 in November. And he spent 14 years in prison, 10 of them on death row for a crime he didn't commit. Um, DNA exonerated him in 2012. And it took us another six years to bring him home uh, because of the, the system and the way that it unfortunately works. And so I worked on his case. I worked on a lot of other cases, um, clients who were severely mentally ill facing the death penalty. I had two clients executed over my period of time doing capital post-conviction work. And in June of this year, I joined FADP as the executive director. Uh, Mark Elliott is on our Zoom tonight, and he was the former executive director, founded um, Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty and got the organization to a place where they were able to hire a, an executive director. And I was honored to uh, take the role on uh, from Mark. And so our organization, um, we are a grassroots statewide organization dedicated to bringing about the end of the death penalty in Florida um, through legislative abolition. And along the way, our goal is to reduce its use, to reduce the impact that it has on the on minorities, on people of color, on the poor, all of those things that we can talk about. And I can answer any questions you have about that. But our goal sort of, our ultimate goal is abolition. And along the way, if Florida is going to have a death penalty, and you know, our legislature and our governor and our courts have indicated that that is where they want to be at this point, then our work is to make sure that it's accurate and reliable and that it is truly prosecuting only the most aggravated and least mitigated and that the most vulnerable members of our society are protected, which is where we come to the mental illness and why we have this sort of intersection here um, with, with our partners in NAMI Brower and uh, NAMI Collier and um, in all of, the, all of our partners in the mental health community. So we know that the death penalty unfortunately disproportionately affects those with serious mental illness. They are among the most vulnerable for a bunch of reasons. They tend to get caught up in the criminal justice system and they tend to not be able to advocate as well for themselves. They tend to not be able to help their lawyers as much as someone without severe mental illness can. They have a tendency to not understand the rights. So they'll make statements to the police that may be against their interest. And so, and also there's concerns in the process itself. I'll, I'll give you sort of the best example it's, it, it always that I have because it's a client I represented. So I represented a client um, by the name of Bill Marquardt. He was serving a sentence in a Wisconsin mental institution, a not guilty by reason of insanity. He was convicted of a crime in Wisconsin and he's diagnosed schizophrenic since he was 19. 
um, and he was serving an NG, we call it an NGRI. So he was serving an NGRI sentence in Wisconsin for a separate crime. There was a DNA hit, a cold case hit in Sumter County, Florida, linking him to a murder scene um, of two women in Sumter County. And they linked him to the murder. They believe they had enough evidence to bring him to trial. They brought him from the mental institution. They like transported him from the actual mental institution to the Sumter County Jail. He, because of his mental illness, in, demanded to represent himself and they let him. Nobody reviewed any of the records um, at the state hospital in Wisconsin. He had a court appointed lawyer who was later disbarred. Um, there was one, one doctor appointed who asked to see the records said like, hey, you know, I know he came from here. Can I see them? And everybody just sort of looked at the sky and nobody gave him these records. And the judge, you know, didn't really have a choice, but to find him competent, there, there's the law says that if you want to represent yourself, you have a constitutional right to do so. So the judges, rightfully so, are always concerned about abridging that right. So they let him go to trial. The, the headlines around the time said things like paranoid schizophrenic represents self. So nobody thought that like this was a good idea in any sense of the word, but it happened. And nobody was in his corner to protect it. And the statute, you know, there was no prohibition against the seeking the death penalty against the severely mentally ill. He was convicted. He was sentenced to death. I got his case in post-conviction. Um, my office got appointed and immediately, you know, was deeply concerned about his competency, his ability to rationally disclose facts. He was very, very seriously mentally ill. And now with advocacy in post-conviction, you're not allowed to waive a lawyer. So at trial, you're allowed to represent yourself, but in post-conviction, you're not allowed to. You're sort of stuck with the lawyer that you get. Um, and so we were able to get doctors appointed to show the court, which was the same judge who to his credit was like, I didn't know any of these things and found him incompetent and incompetent to proceed in post-conviction. So his proceeding is completely at a standstill and it has been for approximately six years because he's not getting better. And what we're left with is this case that's in limbo. We have two victims and victims' family members who believed that they were getting, they believed it was just that it was justice that he got the death sentence they're never, they're very unlikely to get the actual, you know, resolution of an execution because of his severe mental illness and the number and the amount of resources that we've spent trying to bring this person to an ultimate death sentence or execution is, is just staggering. And so anytime I talk to lawmakers and people about, well, why do we need this bill? Why do we need protection for the seriously mentally ill? You know, doesn't that get kind of get caught up? I talk about Bill Marquardt because it's not serving anyone. And, and I think about the victim's family all the time because they're in this limbo state. Whereas if we had this legislation in place, which I'll talk about some specifics in a moment, that would have been at the outset. They would have said, you cannot seek the death penalty against someone with a severe mental illness who imp that impacted his behavior at the time of the crime. So someone like Bill Marquardt will be protected from this bill. They wouldn't have sought the death penalty. That doesn't mean he walks free. That doesn't mean he doesn't get punishment, right? If he's competent to stand trial, which is a different standard than being severely mentally ill, there's there's a lot of different legal standards that go into it. But if if he's found competent to stand trial, but severely mentally ill, then he will be found guilty and he'll be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So it's different than an insanity defense. It's that's it's a completely separate standard. And I know it's a little confusing. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But that's why one of FADP's priorities is to push this legislation to protect the seriously mentally ill from the death penalty. So it went through the legislature in 2021. It got through committee. It never made it to a full vote. And so we're pushing this year um, in the session upcoming to uh, to be able to try to pass that legislation. And so that is one of FADP's priorities. And we've partnered with NAMI in Collier. We've partnered with NAMI in uh, all over the state um, to have their support to try to bring about this legislation protecting the seriously mentally ill from the death penalty. And so that's sort of one of our priorities. And, and you know, I, I want I'm happy to you know answer more questions and talk about that as much as as much as anyone would like and sort of how you can get involved and how you can help. And, you know, we can also talk about the broader issues of problems with the death penalty, problems with Florida's death penalty, what it does, what it doesn't do. 
And, you know, we do know the statistics, right? It disproportionately impacts people of color, disproportionately impacts the poor. Um, Florida's death row, I said, but contains about 350 people. Um, the individuals, it's you're more likely to be sentenced to death if you kill, if you are a person of color, if you kill a white person. So there have there has only been in the state of Florida one person who was executed, a white person for killing a person of color, one person, and it happened in the last two to three years. And so it's it's staggering when you look at the disproportionality of how the death penalty disproportionately impacts the poor and people of color. And so, and and the, the mentally ill are just another subset of that. And, um, and I'm, I see some questions in the chat. I'm gonna talk a little bit longer and then I'll, I'll come back. I just think it's sort of easier to make this a conversation. Um, so I do wanna, wanna answer some of those questions. It, it, we've partnered with local NAMIs. We have the statewide, Bridget can answer this better, but we have the statewide NAMI organization as well. Bridget actually attended um, the NAMI conference in Orlando and we had a table and we were a sponsor for it. So we have their organizations. If there are local organizations, local NAMI chapters, um, that any of you are aware of that have not yet sort of signed on to our letter. And I have, we'll have some action sheets. Bridget um, can pull that up in a moment when we screen share, but um, for what you can do to sign on. So, I mean, I think that's kind of where, you know, where where we go next, right? What are, what are we trying to do and how are we trying to do it? And how can you help if this is something that you're interested in? So we have, um, our website has a ton of actions. Bridget, will you pull up our, um, the first slide, just so that it has our contact information. And while she's uh, while she's pulling that up, so we are, uh, and you can there's we have a petition to sign on to, um, yeah. So go to the who we are, where we are. Yeah, perfect. Um, so can you go to our, yep, there we go. Maybe. So we have a uh, petition on our page as a link to it, how you can help and how you can sign on to our newsletter so that you can get our newsletter and how you can sign the uh, petition to protect the seriously mentally ill from the death penalty. And what we're looking for um, specifically is, so we have the, this is our website um, with the SMI Alliance. There's a, the general petition for folks to sign, which you can see along the right-hand side. And all of these links are will be available in the chat. And then, so that's just sort of for anybody that can sign. If you are a law enforcement member, former law enforcement, current law enforcement, or you know someone who is, we're asking law enforcement to sign on um, to this petition and, and we partner a lot with local law enforcement, especially the sheriff's offices. You know, they do a tremendous amount of Baker Acts and they respond in the community and they sort of see the immediate um, effects of mental illness. And, and a lot of them in seeing that recognize that the death penalty should not be appropriate for those folks. So law enforcement, um, if you or someone you know is a murder victim family member, so if someone, a loved one has been, has been murdered, it doesn't have to be either you live in Florida or the murder happened in Florida. The murder doesn't have to happen in Florida if the sign-on person lives in Florida because they're an impacted person in our state. And so we have a tremendous amount of um, support from murder victims, family members in support of this petition. And then finally, um, faith leaders. So we have a large community of faith leaders from all various, all walks of life, various faiths in Florida who support either full on abolition of the death penalty or this limiting factor of, about, of eliminating the death penalty for the seriously mentally ill. So those are things that you can do. Um, to sort of take action as we get closer to the legislative session and we have bills pending, you know, we'll ask you to contact your local, um, your local legislators, your local state representatives and ask them to support this bill. Um, the president of the Senate is uh, Kathleen Pasadomo and she's of course your uh, senator in Collier County. And so that, that is something we, we are meeting with. I was in Tallahassee yesterday trying to meet with legislative leaders 
to explain to them that this is something that the state of Florida wants and needs. And, you know, everyone that I talk to about it, um, you can go back, Bridget, I don't, we don't need to, you can go back to non-screen sharing for now. Um, and, you know, everyone that I, that we sort of talk to, that I talk to about this issue is there's not usually a dispute about should we or shouldn't we execute the seriously mentally ill, right? Everyone generally agrees, much like we sort of generally agree that we don't execute people who are under the age of 18. Like it's sort of a general consensus that we don't want to execute the seriously mentally ill. The dispute or the issue or what I hear from, you know, prosecutors and judges and people who are in favor of the death penalty generally is, okay, but how do you know, you know, how do we know who, is there going to be some abuse, right? How you're just going to open floodgates and everybody's going to say that they're mentally ill. And so, you know, it's for me, I come from, I come at, honestly, right? I, I believe in the full-on abolition of the death penalty. So I don't believe that anybody deserves the death penalty. And I'm, I'm clear and candid about that. However, I do understand and respect that some people feel differently and that we do have a death penalty in the state of Florida. And so the dispute is, okay, how do we make sure that it's not subject to abuse or overuse or that there are limiting factors? And, and the language is, is simple. I mean, we, we pass a bill that is narrowly tailored to make sure that it's truly those who are severely mentally ill, like my client, Bill Marquardt, undisputed. Nobody disagreed that he had schizophrenia. Nobody disagreed. He was serving a sentence in a mental institution. He would have been there. He had a 75-year sentence. Um, he would have been there in a safe, secure, locked environment getting treatment, which is where he should be. He should be in a hospital, not in on death row, awaiting his potential eventual execution. Because we as a society shouldn't kill the sick and the broken. Right. There's no no benefit to that. And so what we've done and what we're partnering with is state attorneys and sheriff's offices to get language that everybody is comfortable with. And it may involve listing diagnoses. It, it may not. And, and look, one of my very favorite quotes from Martin Luther King is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So this bill that we pass may not be my dream wish list, right? Again, I think that we ultimately should come to a place where we agree that abolition is, is the way to go because I, I don't think we need it as a state. But until we get there, we need to continue to limit and, and limit its use. And so there are ways that we can do that and make sure that there are safeguards in place to, to, to do that. And I've yet to hear anybody that I've spoken to, I've yet to hear the, the view of like, oh no, like we should execute the mentally ill. It's, it's, well, how do I know, is he really mentally ill? And so there are definitely ways to, to make sure that we can have those safeguards, like I said, in place. Um, so I've been talking for about 25 minutes already. Um, I could do this forever. I could tell you all sorts of stories and statistics about the death penalty and, um, and share lots of stories of my representation of Clemente and, and any other cases and clients. But I really want to hear from you. And I want to know, you, know, you guys all signed up on this Zoom because the, is the issue is interesting to you. And I want to know what your questions are and how you feel about it and how I can answer them. And, and that's, one of my favorite things about being executive director is I get to talk to so many people from so many different walks of life and experiences. And so I, I want to turn it over to you all to have to answer questions. And I know Bridget, I think has some as well, um, but I'll, I'll leave it out. Um, for. All right. I would, I would like to spend a little bit of time before we open it up to talk about NAMI. And I had invited um, Beth Hatch, who is the director of NAMI of Collier, to speak, which she had agreed to, but she has had a, a family emergency. Um, and so all of NAMI, NAMI of the United States, does their position on the death penalty is to abolish, uh, to not use it for the seriously mental, mentally ill. Um, and the seriously mental ill is defined as uh, those with bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder and schizophrenia. And again, it is a biological disease. It is different than a temporary mental health concern. It is, with an illness, it, it causes daily problems. Um, it affects how one thinks, feels, and acts. And mental illness is not a choice, a weakness, or a character flaw. Um, and there are various factors that place people at risk for developing a serious mental illness, 
including family genetics, brain chemistry, and experiencing a trauma. Uh, also during pregnancy, having the mother be ill. Uh, so NAMI, uh, the NAMI of the United States opposes the death penalty for people with serious mental illness. And as Maria said, there are quite a number of issues um, that create uh, an overrepresentation of them in the criminal justice system and of being e executed. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to just show a few slides of um, that tell a little bit about mental health and tell about NAMI of Collier. And thank you, uh, Bridget is loading it. So one in five Americans have some form of mental health diagnosis. Okay, next, next slide, please. And nearly 50 million American adults ex experienced mental illness in 2019. So next slide, please. More than half of American adults with a mental illness do not receive treatment. Okay, next slide, please. And over 15% of youth experienced a major depressive episode in the past year. And now, yeah, thank you. So um, NAMI of Collier is the gold standard in the country for programs and services because they have so many. Uh, Florida SDC is, is self-directed care. And with that, they um, can receive life, a life coach. The Sarah Ann Center is a drop-in center that uh, provides daily lunches. It sets up field trips. Uh, on the right, you see they have been very helpful in Collier with uh, finding housing. Um, the Collier Hugs is a screening program for preschool children to identify those that need services for behavioral health uh, services. And CLEAR is a peer-run phone line that is available for those with mental illness. Um, and it is every evening, available every evening. So it's a wonderful program. And um, you can stop sharing, Bridget. Thank you. And we'll, we'll start with, with questions. And I get to start first. <laughs> um, so, so Maria, how would ending Florida's death penalty for people with serious um, mental illness make Florida safer? Well, so a number of ways. I think that we, when we talk about safety, we want to make sure that we can safely house people in prison for the remainder of their lives or in a locked mental facility without having them be a danger to someone else, right? So that is, that is absolutely something we can do with a life sentence. Like I said, this bill, this legislation does not excuse criminal activity. It does not allow people to be released. It's, it's basically a life sentence without the possibility of parole. But I think what it also does is it frees up resources. So the death penalty in and of itself is extremely expensive, right? We could spend hours talking about how much, how much more costly it is to try to execute someone than it is for a life sentence without the possibility of parole. But even more so in a death penalty case where there's severe mental illness. I, I have another client that I represented who's been incompetent for, I think, 12 years now. And so one of the judge at one point went through a list of all of the times she had to appoint doctors because the state was continually contesting his competency. And she had to appoint doctors and we had records and evidentiary hearing after evidentiary hearing. And so the cost of trying to prosecute and execute somebody who's seriously mentally ill is even more so than just a regular death penalty case, which is exorbitantly expensive in and of itself. And so what I always think makes the most sense, right, is how can we use those resources 
to actually make us safer. So can we put those resources that are spent trying to execute someone with severe mental illness, can we put them back into the community? Can we put that resource into the local NAMI chapters? Can we put that res those resources back where people can actually get treatment and receive treatment and their places that they can go for their mental health? Can we use those resources to, you know, to help restrict access to weapons with people with diagnosed severe mental illness. There's lots of things that we can do with those cost savings. So I think the safety measure is, is two ways. It's one, we can be safe by separating them from society in a either an incarcerative setting in a prison without the possibility of parole or in a locked hospital setting where they can get treatment, but they cannot, you know, they're not going to be released to the public. And it, so if if that's the case, that's safety there. And then can we also use the resources spent um, to make our community safer in other ways? Hey, thank you. Um, what are some of the human rights and constitutional issues involved with the death penalty? I mean, so I think the death penalty a, a couple of ways. So we talk, we can talk about it as a moral issue. We can talk about it as a religious issue. We can talk about, you know, there are plenty of organizations and groups that support FADP and our work that believe in the dignity of human life from conception to natural death. And so they believe that the death penalty is wrong on those moral and religious grounds. From a human rights standpoint, you know, I've never really understood. I, I had a client's young daughter once, she was probably 10 or 11. She was trying to understand why the state of Florida was trying to kill her father. And she was like trying to wrap her mind around it. And I'm sitting in her living room and she's like, okay, so my dad killed somebody. So he has to die. Who kills the person who kills my dad? Like she couldn't, she didn't understand then like, how do you sort of get the violence, like which understandably so, right? Like we say that we kill someone to show that killing is wrong. And so to me, that is sort of a core human rights violation in that it just affects and imprints upon the dignity of life. And that is why so many civilizations, so many democracies have abolished the death penalty. I mean, the United States is an outlier in its use of the death penalty. And the South in the United States is an outlier in its use of the death penalty. Um, you know, I, more, I was just reading some statistics today and, you know, more than 35 of our states either don't have a death penalty or don't actively execute. And when you really look at the executions, they're concentrated in a super, super small majority of states, four or five handful of states that are doing this. So it's disproportionate, right? The same, the same crime that happens in Florida and happens in, you know, a state like Wisconsin who doesn't have the death penalty doesn't get the same, doesn't get the same treatment. And that's not right. That's not fair. Um, and then in terms of the constitutional violations, you know, we talked about the disproportionality towards people of color and minorities, that it disproportionately targets those folks, and they are overrepresented in our, not just in our prison system, which of course they are, but also on death row than they are in our general population. Okay, uh, what do we say to people who think that um, if this gets passed, that then people will just use mental illness as an excuse? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that is the question I get the most, right, from the from our legislators, and they want to make sure that they're keeping their constituents safe. And I understand that. And I think the answer is, it's, we have, we, we write a strong bill that has safeguards and procedures and process. And this is not up to these are what will happen is like, let's sort of have a case that we have this law passed. Uh, somebody says to the prosecutor, hey, my client meets this criteria, they're diagnosed with bipolar, schizophrenia, major depressive, whatever the list is. And they say to the prosecutor, I believe you shouldn't seek the death penalty based on this. The prosecutor can say, let me have him evaluated. Let me look at the records. I agree with you. It's over. We're not seeking the death penalty. That's step one safeguard, right? Step two is the prosecutor can say, mm, I'm not sure. I don't think that this is quite serious enough. Let's have a hearing. And so then a judge gets to have a hearing and hear testimony. And we trust judges. We elect judges in the state and we trust them to make hard decisions all the time. And so, and then that judge makes a decision. Yes, I think that they meet criteria. No, I don't think they do. Then there's another step after that, which is the appellate record. So that would go to the Florida Supreme Court. It would ultimately go to the federal court to look and say, you know, yeah, I think that this person does have serious mental illness and either party would get to appeal, right? So let's say the judge says, you know what defense, I agree with you. This man meets, this man or woman meets criteria and the state, you can't seek the death penalty. And the state feels absolutely differently and they get to appeal and they get to appeal to a higher court and they get to exercise their right to say, no, 
um, we, we disagree. So there's just a tremendous amount of safeguards that we will put in place to make sure that the process is, is fair and is not abused. And, and to be candid and clear, like lawyers are already raising this issue and that's kind of how things evolve in the death penalty, right? It was 2005 is when we decided that we should no longer execute children. So that wasn't that long ago. Um, and it took lots of years of lawyers saying, hey, you know, children's brains are different. They shouldn't be executed if they were under 18 at the time of the crime. And it took years and years to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. And they ultimately said, you're right. So lawyers are already doing this with serious mental illness. Several other states have passed um, laws, Ohio and Kentucky are two, that have passed pretty restrictive laws on this. And, you know, we're not seeing, you know, massive spikes in motions being filed and, and sort of abuses. So I think the sort of anecdotally, the evidence is there, but also the number of safeguards that we would put in place. Okay, thank you. Um, is there an organization that brings peer-led counseling to mentally ill incarcerated people? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, in Florida, there isn't, not that I'm aware of, um, although um, Bridget and I met with a woman from Texas who is actually leading a program to try to train counselors and clinicians to do exactly that, to train, to, to counsel people incarcerated. Florida, the Florida Department of Corrections is dramatically understaffed and over full. And so the mental health treatment in the Department of Corrections is, it's abysmal, unfortunately. And so there really are no um, organizations like that. Now, there are plenty of volunteer groups, mostly chaplains. They're really the only way that they can get in to, um, to see the prisoners on death row, but they sort of act sometimes as kind of all, all trades, right, counselors, but no formally trained counselors are available to our folks on death row. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, so someone asked, is there a sponsor for the serious mentally ill bill in either the House or the Senate? So not yet. That is our main priority. It was sponsored by Senator Brandis and Representative Alupis in the past, both of whom have left the Florida legislature, unfortunately. So we have been meeting with potential targets and talking with lots of sponsors. The thing that sort of happened, um, you know, kind of statewide, which I'm sure many of you know about, is in October of this year, a jury um, rejected a death sentence for uh, Nicholas Cruz, the shooter in the Parkland case. And that because of the just devastating nature of the crime, there was a lot of um, intense feelings that the jury in that case, that there were three, um, two, three votes for life in that case, that they got it wrong. And there's been some talk to try to change Florida's statute to go back. Florida was one of only two states that required, didn't have to require unanimity. They were really an outlier status. And in 2016, the US Supreme Court said that is unconstitutional, it has to be unanimous. The legislature went to unanimity. There's been some talk of um, going back after the Parkland verdict. So we've been monitoring that quite a bit. And so the death penalty is, is a little bit sort of, we wanna make sure that, again, we want it to be reliable and accurate. So we believe SMI needs to pass this session. And we also wanna make sure Florida doesn't return to non-unanimity. So in our conversations, um, you know, we're talking about both of those things, but, but we don't have a sponsor yet, but we are, we are pushing strong forward to find one. And, and I think that we will. Good, I hope so. Um, does FADP partner with victim adv advocacy groups? Yes. So, I mean, we definitely always speak with murder victim family members and we, you know, there's, there are plenty of, or we are always willing, I am personally always willing to listen and talk to an affected person. And my job as, a, as an assistant public defender, you know, I, I represent folks that are facing the death penalty um, and we speak all the time to victims and ask, you know, what they want and, and make sure they have an understanding of the process um, and sort of how the process takes and how long it takes and all of those things. And so, yeah, I mean, we definitely, we hear a lot from victims, family members who, want, don't want the death penalty and not because they like aren't deeply devastated and don't want, you know, justice for their loved one, but because they don't want to, two things, they don't want to be dragged back into court over and over again about this case. And these death penalty cases take a really long time to move through the system. And also they don't want the case to be about 
the perpetrator who committed the crime, right? They, and in a death penalty case, unfortunately, it has to be under the law because you cannot sentence someone to death under the law unless the crime is the most aggravated and the least mitigated. That's what the law says. And by least mitigated, that means that the person, you know, didn't have a traumatic childhood, didn't have a serious mental illness, didn't have, you know, severe head injuries, all of the things. And so inevitably what happens in a death penalty trial be, to satisfy the law is the story is about the perpetrator, right? And the victim gets lost in that. And so, so many family members that I've spoken to, that's what they say, you know, that's my, my personal belief. And that's what I've always said, you know, since, I mean, since I was even back when I was a prosecutor, I was like, I don't, you know, I want it to be about the person that was killed and the person whose life was lost. And so the death penalty takes that away. Yes, the, the idea of restorative justice uh, doesn't really occur when we just look at punishment and, and with restorative meaning that the, the perpetrator takes responsibility for what they did and tries to repair the harm. Yeah, I mean, I, we've had that, I've had that happen in a number of cases um, that have come back sort of on her three sentencings. We've had cases where our client, you know, especially, especially the sort of ones who are incredibly young, I had a client who was 18 at the time, you know, and 30 years go by and they sort of understand and they offer, I've had many clients offer to, and some have sat down with victims, family members and, you know, accepted responsibility, mm -hmm. expressed remorse and, and it was well received. And sometimes the victim's family members don't want to hear that. And that's okay too, right? That's never sort of forced upon them. I always try to make sure that we understand what their position is and why and how and how they got there and make sure that they're heard. Um, and so, right. I mean, to me, that is, I mean, that is my personal belief is that there is always room for restoration, redemption, um, and some healing even if that means, and it will mean the alternative to the death penalty, right? We are Floridians for alternatives to the death penalty, which is a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Nobody is advocating or suggesting that people walk out of prison. So that's that's something that I always wanna be clear about when we're talking about the death penalty. Um, we're talking about a, a very severe alternative punishment. Yeah, it's, it's not letting them free. Um, Charlotte mentioned that she thinks the, st the statistics are that 1% of crimes, that 1% that of the crimes are committed by uh, people with serious mental illness, only 1%. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a bit higher than that in terms of the, especially when you look at, if you just look at the sort of death row population and whatever the diagnosis, you know, we, we're, we're calling all of that data as far as what people were able to argue at their trial. And it's but dependent on a number of factors. You know, sometimes people had lawyers who, like my client, Bill Marquardt, who had a lawyer who was later disbarred that didn't present any, you know, didn't present anything. Um, but it's, it's a little higher. We, we estimate um, it's probably closer to the population of death row, right, is probably closer to 10% that have serious mental illness. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure, Ray, what you mean. So you might want to un un um, unmute, but he, uh, Ray is asking, could we not try to fix the problem that exists first before going to full abolition? Maria, first let me say that I admire what you're doing, and I agree with you on many counts, whether the state has it or not, that our system is broke, and it's not working because we're not doing the right things, and especially with mentally ill as well as race. However, given the uphill battle that you have, you mentioned at one point, if you can't get full abolition, couldn't you get a better sell if we can push those things that would help fix the process that's in place right now, and then eventually show how these things work and then go for abolition. I, it seems like to try to get it all at one time is gonna be very hard, particularly with violent crimes being up so much. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And I think that is sort of, we see this sort of bill about the seriously mentally ill as sort of a path, as sort of a reform, as sort of a limiting, right? It doesn't abolish the death penalty completely. It just limits its use. And so there are plenty of things that we do, we can do and should do in that movement. I I would love to see the state of Florida do a cost study about the death penalty, like an honest, real cost study that shows how much a prosecution in a death case costs, how much incarcerative, all of the things so that we can actually have the numbers and, and that the people of the state of Florida can choose and say, okay, a death penalty costs this much and a life and sentence without the possibility of parole costs this much and we don't want that. So I think there are definitely things we can do before we get to abolition to show that it's unfair, to show that it's disproportionate. Um, and this, the SMI passing is, is one is one way to do that. And also to make sure that we keep unanimity of the law, right? If, if the Florida legislature goes back and says, oh no, only a simple majority is needed, we're gonna see a, an uptick in death sentences. But what we're also going to see as the years go on, which we saw happen with the Hearst case in 2016, eventually the US Supreme Court will say again, hey, Florida, we told you, you can't do that. And then these cases go back to the beginning. So then all of these victims, family members are already back to the beginning again. You know, this it's like this wound is being ripped open every single time. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right in that we need to sort of think about what steps can we take towards reform before full-on abolition. And we see the SMI bill, which would, you know, again, be a small percentage, right? Anywhere from kind of one to 10% of our people that it, that it would protect um, as, as a step in the right direction. Okay, and Ray, oh, sorry. Ray also asked about the victims and the families of violent, uh, brutal crimes. Where are these proposals uh, taking into consideration on the outcomes uh, bringing fairness to them? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And also I see um, Doris in the, in the chat also noted and, uh, and I'm glad that she's on as well. I think that absolutely, the victim's family members should have a say and an, in, an input, right? And, and they do, and they do in the process and the seeking. The law says for a good number of reasons that they don't get to make the ultimate decision, right? Because we're, we're a country of laws, right? We don't have, we can't just, you know, say like, okay, settle this out in the street, right? Like things used to do. And, and that's so, so they, they're, but their views, I don't know a single state attorney who wouldn't take into account what a victim has to say in, if they're in favor of the death penalty. But I, I, I know Doris is on and she had an opposite experience. Um, her father was murdered and she did not want the death penalty. And sometimes those voices are ignored and sometimes, and you know, I'm guilty of it too. And I try really hard not to be like, I do not want to ever impose my own views onto someone else, right? I don't want to, I'm not going to hear to tell you what you should feel or how you should feel or how you should react. I want to listen. I want to hear, I want to hear what it is you have to say. And then I want them to have the information about the process and about what it really looks like. And I think that is something that's lacking. And I've seen it as a state attorney myself. I've seen it as a public defender where we don't want to tell victims the real truth of the process because we know it's upsetting for them to hear, but they need to, that it'll the length of time that it will take and and all of those things and so I think that we have to really listen to what they have to say but listen to what they have to say even when it's not what the prosecutor may want to hear right if a loved one said if a, if a family of a loved one who's murdered says I don't want the death penalty that really should be taken into account I think and it should also be taken into account if they do want the death penalty if the law and the facts support it so yeah I mean we absolutely have to listen to what they want I had done some research uh, because after Nicholas Cruz got the life sentence, a lot of people were saying, uh, I don't want my money going for his food and health care, um, unfortunately. Um, but I read somewhere they were estimating the average cost for the death uh, a case with the death penalty would be about 10 million in Florida, whereas, uh, of course, it would vary greatly on their health and how long they live, but would be more, would be less than a million, would be in the hundred thousands for a life sentence. Um, is that 
does that sound reasonable yeah. to you? And why, why would it be 10 million? Why would it be that expensive? So a bunch of reasons, and, and, and you know the cruise, the cruise case is an example, and we have the numbers because they're filing the numbers as far as what it costs for, for like his supervision and in terms of in the jail and sort of pretrial and the cost of prosecution and the defense. And I mean, it's numbering into the millions. And that case is unique because of the scope and magnitude. But the reason it's so expensive is because of the process um, that has to be in place. That, that the law says if you are going, if the state is going to take someone's life, they have to give all of these safeguards in place. And so the lawyers, the 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 trial costs more. There has to be twelve jurors. They have to have two separate trials: a guilt phase and a penalty phase. So there's a lot more in the in the upfront cost. There's a lot more experts that need to be involved: mental health experts, other experts. And then what really is sort of costly is the appellate process that has to take place. And I, you know, I talked to a, a, a victim, murder victim family member from the Parkland shooting and we had a conversation and, and he said, you know, he very much obviously is in favor of the death penalty, believed that, that Mr. Cruz should have gotten the death penalty. And I understand his feelings completely, but what he did say was, I understand the process has to be what the process is. I mean, Florida leads the nation in exonerations. It took us six years to get Clemente home after DNA because of this process. And so you cannot say that like, oh, well, just let's speed it up. Let's make it faster. We can't do that. And so the process is expensive. And I mean, just to give you an example, the agency that I worked for, Capital Collateral Regional Council, is there's three offices in the state of Florida and each office has a budget of, I don't know, it's been a while, about 3 million or so, three to 4 million. So figure like nine to 10 million just for each year per year, just for that office to exist. And that office has to exist because they are lawyers that represent these folks from when their death sentence is affirmed through either execution, natural death or relief. And so, I mean, we're talking, you're talking $10 million a year that the state of Florida would save like that if they abolish the death penalty. So, I mean, there's there's tons and tons of numbers like that. And the, the, the cost on death row is higher because the men are in single cells. So at that kind of supervision and higher security is um, is more expensive. There are, you know, there are still safeguards within DOC that there are people who aren't serving death sentences who are in that level of high security because um, because of, you know, their own sort of assessment and risk and things like that. But by death, because you have a death sentence, you could be the most mild mannered prisoner of all time. I mean, I have a client who's been on death row for 40 years and he like has never gotten in trouble ever. You know, he never has never had one, we call it a DR, um, but he will be in, he has to be in this higher level of security because of his sentence. Um, and so that in and of itself is just more costly than somebody who can be in general population and open bay population in a life sentence. All right, someone asking is asking about the basis for getting rid of the death penalty for this specific group. Is it because they aren't considered totally responsible for what they did? Yeah, so responsibility is sort of a tricky word, but I think the short answer is yes. We talk in terms of moral culpability in terms of the death penalty. So they are responsible in the sense of they are criminally responsible in that they can be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. So this is different than an insanity case. There's there's a, there's a standard in Florida, if you are legally insane at the time means you did not know what you were doing. Like you did not know what you were doing was wrong. And, and that is a very high intentionally standard to meet. This is not that. This is saying you have a severe mental illness. Your severe mental illness impacted your ability. So we look at, when we look at sort of moral culpability for the death penalty, we look at like, not just like, do it's like, do they deserve to die? But like, do we deserve to kill them, right? So does somebody have, you know, did somebody grow up with sort of every privilege and, you know, completely healthy, intact family, all the educational opportunities, and then just sort of make a choice to like commit murder. I can tell you from experience, not a single one of my clients had a happy, healthy, well-adjusted childhood, not a single one. So, but that's why we talk about moral, moral culpability. So somebody with a severe mental illness doesn't have the same ability to discern between varying degrees of right and wrong, doesn't have the same level of impulse control, doesn't have the same level of perception of the world, right? Like the client that I spoke about, Mr. Marquardt, believed it through command hallucinations that he was having to rid the world of the antichrist, 
Like that was, that was what his mental illness was telling him to do. And so that someone who is doing that is not as morally culpable as somebody who has all of their mental faculties and makes a choice to kill for, you know, money or whatever, you know, what sort of whatever the reason is. So yeah, we're, the argument is that by definition, these folks with the severe mental illness are less morally culpable. It doesn't mean they're not responsible. It doesn't mean they shouldn't be punished. It's they shouldn't be punished with the ultimate punishment. Thank you. And thank you for that question. That's very helpful. Um, I do want to um, mention to to our attenders that there are links in here that are that Bridget is putting in that are very helpful. There's a fact sheet and I think a one and then one is for the uh, petition. Um, and the emails are also in here. There are also emails for getting in touch. And I do uh, want to, to thank um, Vincent Keys, who is here tonight. He is the president of our local NAACP, the NAACP of Collier. And he works so tirelessly uh, to help support the vulnerable in our community. And so thank you so much for taking time to be with us tonight. Um, and that is a very, not only am I cons concerned about the serious mentally ill and their treatment in the justice system, but I have read horrible stories of how people of different colors are treated. And I do know from my involvement with the Innocence Project that um, an innocent black man is seven times more likely to be convicted of murder than a innocent white man. And so that's a real strong uh, problem in our system also. So thank you. Um, if I, I think, I think I've asked them all, um, you are getting very positive comments and I, I just cannot imagine what it be, must be like to represent someone with the death penalty, what it must be like. I have so much respect for you and for you to bring that experience in and be able to answer these questions is has just been so helpful. Um, is there anything you would like to say, Maria, before we end? No, I mean, just, you know, thank you all so much for listening for your interest in this. And like Bridget said, um, you know, we have all the links. We are happy to talk. We are happy to give similar presentations. If you have an organization that you're like, I really want people to hear this, I'm happy to do that. This is my passion and my life's goal is to bring about the end of the death penalty in Florida in my lifetime. So um, I will and would love to talk to absolutely every single person who is impacted and affected by this. And I don't want to just hear, right, I'm not someone who just like wants an echo chamber. So I like and welcome hard questions and people who have been impacted and have different feelings and views. I, I welcome that dialogue because that is the only way we're going to bring about this change. All right, um, let me just do one more check. Yes, you're, you're getting lots. Uh, okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, somebody want to? Yeah, can I just ask a quick question? Not, yeah. not a question, but a point. Seeing what we're investing on the back end of all this must frustrate you in that we invest very little upfront into mental care and all. And it's sad that if we would switch that, then we may not have as many going into steep problems as you're dealing with. It's uh, frustrating. It's uh, just very, very frustrating. frustrating. I, I spend, try to spend a lot of time, um, my friends and friends who are teachers and who like are daycare workers and teach our children. Cause I'm like, that is, that's the place. Like we can like studies show, like if there is one person, if a child has a terrible home life, but there is one person in that child's life that care, a teacher, a coach, parents, friends, something like that, that we can stop them from having these outcomes. So that is, it is incredibly frustrating. I could see, I wish we could spend those resources that we're spending on the death penalty in many other ways. Yes, and, and looking at juvenile justice, uh, there is a high number of juveniles in the system that have had adverse childhood experiences 
and being living in poverty in and of is in and of itself an adverse experience and creates physical and mental health can create physical and mental health problems. Um, and some um, let's are you okay with one more question, Maria? Yeah. Um, says Carlton has one more question and then and then uh, there's one other question as well. Oh, there's a question. Somebody would like to know about your yoga. Yes, um, I love yoga. Um, I teach, I've been a, a teacher for a long time. I, I do teach um, for an organization. I don't have a class on the schedule right now, but I'm on their substitution list, but I taught for a very long time for, it's called Yoga for Change. Um, they're based in Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, and South Florida. And our, we have four populations, which is the incarcerated, the people in substance abuse recovery, juveniles, and um, the military. And I taught for about a year and a half in a substance abuse facility to women in recovery. I taught for another year at a juvenile detention facility um, to young men who were in a juvenile program. And it's amazing and remarkable how you can bring um, in teaching yoga and bring people sort of the ideas to connect them back to their physical body and people who have suffered trauma often are disconnected from their physical body um, as a defense mechanism. And so yoga allows them to sort of bring that back. It allows them to have kind of some peace and relaxation. For me personally, I teach at a studio here in Tampa and I practice regularly and I sort of, it's kind of a joke, but it's true is I, yoga keeps me from needing my own representation. Um, it definitely is something that keeps me grounded and calm, but you can see there, I mean, we've done studies about the scientific benefits of just even sitting quietly breathing um, for five minutes a day and what it does to your nervous system. And so people who are in high level trauma all the time, um, they have a, an exaggerated fight or flight response. And so yoga works to reduce that anxiety. Um, and so it's, it's a huge part of recovery in, in many places. Um, and I love teaching yoga and that and to those populations is so enjoyable to me. And um, one of my students at the juvenile detention facility, you know, it's like 15 to 17 year old boys, like getting them to imagine them trying to like settle down to, to do yoga and to be able to relax. And one of them after weeks fell asleep at the end, it's called Shavasana. It's like our sort of resting pose. He fell asleep. And I was just like, I mean, I was like trying to hold, I got in my car and just sobbed like a baby, but I'm holding back tears the whole time because for him to actually be able to fall asleep in a setting, in a prison style setting was, and, and, you know, he had been coming to class every week for, you know, probably three to, I think it was probably about six weeks at that time. And it took him that long to be able to just, and he fell asleep and it was just like his snoring was just music to my ears. So it, it's, it's magical. It really does work. Wow. Oh, and so Doris says, yes, let's spend the money on, tra on trauma recovery centers. And anyway, I want to thank all of you for attending and Maria, wow, what a deep understanding you have of, of people and of psychology and of vagus nerve uh, theory, et cetera. You, you know it all, I'm really impressed. Um, and so we're, we're gonna close now and I thank everyone for this very, very important topic and, and giving your time to this and hope that you will uh, have some interest in, in helping the Floridas for Alternative to the Death Penalty get this bill. Uh, well, first they have to get a sponsor, but once they do uh, to get it passed. So thank you so much you, and have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Hooray! Thank you. Thank you, Vincent.